Uh, my name is Randy Thompson. I'm K5ZD. Uh, welcome to the WRTC 2014 pregame show. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation. The WWROF is a nonprofit corporation focused on the support of ham radio contesting. Uh, they provide the go to meeting services for this website. Uh, they also are um, very uh, instrumental in uh, funding and helping to manage the CQ Worldwide and CQWPX infrastructure, uh, the robot, the website, log checking software, all this cool stuff that we uh, take for granted every day. Um, they're the ones who help make it possible. They've also contributed to uh, WRTC 2014 as well. So thanks for attending today. What we're going to talk about is a little background about WRTC, what it is, where it came from. We're going to talk about some of the people who are coming, the competitors and referees, and the people that are making it possible, some about the infrastructure, and then we'll talk a little bit about different ways that you can uh, participate from home. So when we talk about contesting, or um, another word that's uh, used in the title of our competition, radio sport, um, the uh, usual idea is to see how many people you can contact in the most countries or states or whatever the criteria is in a certain period of time. Could be four hours, could be 12 hours, could be all the way to 48 hours. Um, and there's lots of contests during the year. But one of the challenges that we have in contesting is the fact that uh, there's so many variables. Uh, stations on top of a hilltop with big antennas will typically do better than a station in a valley. <laughs> Uh, same thing if you're on a rare uh, island or um, next to the ocean or whatever the case may be. So operator ability is still very important. It's, you can overcome a lot of these variables through operator skill and so on, but there's always this nagging question of, well, who's really the best or how would I compare with those guys in the other part of the world? So what if we could take all the operators, bring them to one place, put them in similar locations on flat ground, give them identical antennas, give them 100 watts, so they're all running the same power, and then have a referee um, watching over their shoulder uh, to make sure that uh, they're following all the rules. And that's exactly what WRTC does. So in the seventh world, this is the seventh World Radio Sport Team Championship, and uh, the idea is everybody comes together, same location, same antenna system, same power level, and they really bring their equipment and technology and they bring their operating ability and that's what makes the competition. So a few basics. Um, the the uh, WRTC has fallen into a pattern where it is run in parallel or concurrently with the IARU HF championship every four years. And um, this actually works out really well because it's a global international contest, has lots of activity, uh, so it gives us a good platform for running the competition. And one of the other things that's um, a little bit unusual about WRTC is that the, it consists of two operator teams. So it's not an individual event, it's a team event. And the team consists of two people. Uh, there's a qualifying process to select the team leaders and then the team leader gets to select who they want to be their, um, to be their partner. So let's take a quick poll now and uh, tell me what your role is in, um, in WRTC. So you should see the poll show up and just start to, uh, and select which of these categories that you are. Are you a competitor? Are you a referee? Are you a volunteer who's going to be working at WRTC? Are you going to be somebody at home who's chasing the teams on the air? or are you going to really just be a spectator? <laughs> All right, that gives us a good start. So, um, oops, I didn't mean to. Uh, it Okay, so what we see from this, uh, or 
based on the answers that we got, is 23% of the audience today is a competitor. It's very good. People who are they're looking ahead to see uh, what, they're, <laughs> what they're getting into. 7% are referees. 17% are volunteers at the event. 42% will, well, here, let me put it up on the screen. 42% um, will be chasing teams on the air, and 11% are spectators. So we have a little bit of um, everything uh, here today. So that's great. So WRTC, uh, over the years, it started off in 1990. It was actually run under the auspices of the Goodwill Games. Um, uh, you may remember that Ted Turner was trying to create an alternative to the Olympics. And it was kind of a competition between the USA and the USSR. And some guys in Seattle, led by K7SS, uh, got the idea of, well, let's get teams to come to Seattle and we'll have a competition and that's really where the, it wasn't called the WRTC then, but that's where it got started. And from there, um, in 1996, the Northern California Contest Club uh, decided to hold another one. And I think that's really where things started. That's the first one that I attended. And it really um, kind of cemented this thing as something that, that was exciting and uh, really brought the ham radio contesting community together and uh, gave us, a, you know, a, a place to, really have lots more fun, have lots of fun in the competition from from San Francisco it went to um, Slovenia in 2000 s50a was the leader there uh, from there it went to Finland um, the contest club of Finland did a fantastic job of putting everything together notice that it was only a two-year gap so they did a great job to get everything ready to go in in just two years but they were anxious to um, conduct the competition while we were at the peak of the sunspot cycle, uh, given the northerly latitude. Four years later, it went to Florianopolis, Brazil, and um, it was winter down there. We were at a beautiful luxury uh, hotel for the event, uh, but the water was so cold, I think only the Russians were the ones that were willing to go in and go swimming. But it turned out to be a fantastic uh, competition, far away from all the population centers, um, but very interesting uh, change and just got another continent represented. Uh, from uh, Brazil, it went to Moscow, Russia, and um, led by RZ3AA and RA3AUU. And uh, the Russians actually have a lot of experience in doing these kind of on-site competitions. They have something called the RRTC that they do every year and have been doing for a long time. And uh, so the idea of people coming to a location, setting up a um, temporary field day style station, operating for some period of time is something they're familiar with and have a lot of experience with. And they did a fantastic job. I think everyone came away from Moscow um, thinking this was a real sporting competition. All the locations were uh, were equal and the equipment was equal and first class and, and just was really exciting. And at that point, um, a group of us got together and, and put in a bid to host the 2014 WRTC in New England. And we were accepted by the sanctioning committee uh, just about, it was um, end of September uh, four years ago, and uh, we've been working on it ever since. Here are the organizers for WRTC 2014. Um, Doug, K1DG, has really been the engine uh, and the leadership behind this whole thing. He has been unstoppable <laughs> and uh, untiring in pushing everything forward. Uh, we have a very good team, though. Um, I've been handling the marketing communications. KM3T is doing the IT infrastructure. N2NT has been handling the rules and the competition. N6TR, um, who has experience in doing log checking for WRTC before, will be handling that function here. K1RX is responsible for the beam teams. We'll talk about more of them uh, later on, but their their job was, his job was to really design the antenna system and organize the teams that are going to set it up. K1KI has done an incredible job of finding locations all around New England and going through the paperwork process to get approval to use them, and also um, organizing the site teams that will be located at each um, operating site. Uh, John K1AR is doing the uh, doing the uh, hospitality uh, work, and um, that's 
the hotel and the tours and, and everything to take care of all our visitors when they come in. Uh, we could not have made it through this whole process without WC1M handling the finance. It has been a, uh, a big job, and he has done fantastic work at keeping us all on budget and uh, watching over every penny. And then K1TO handled the uh, qualifying. Uh, he, he's really been managing the team and referee selection all the way through this process. And then we have an advisory council of people who um, who contributed uh, resources to WRTC and have uh, been helpful in uh, giving us their advice on, on how to manage the event. Our goals for WRTC 2014 were um, very simple. Uh, we had three. We wanted to hold a fair competition, so we wanted to follow the um, the the lesson or the um, example of uh, Moscow, and that everything, everyone at every station has a chance to win. Uh, we wanted to ensure that all the participants have an excellent experience, that they um, come away, you know, having met other contesters, having enjoyed the venue, having enjoyed the competition, having enjoyed some their visit to the U.S. And um, we also wanted to use this event to promote ham radio to the public, not only in New England, but beyond. And uh, we have really uh, are having a great deal of interest from the media uh, for this event. It's been really exciting to talk to them and, and expose them to the radio sporting aspects of ham radio. So let's start at the beginning for team selection. This is the part K1TO was responsible for. Uh, divided the world into 29 qualifying regions, and this was partly based on some historical activity patterns in WRTC, but also it was based on where the contest activity was. So we kind of looked at the world and tried to divide it into, you know, logical groupings, not only for geography, but also for number of active contesters. Once we had the qualifying regions, then there were 55 qualifying events, so 55 different contests that were selected over a three-year period. And anyone could enter any of these qualifying events, compare their, their score would be compared to the winner in their region, and they would take their best 12 scores, and that became their qualifying number. And the teams were selected based on those scores. So we ended up selecting 51 team leaders from the regions. Uh, so some of the regions have more than one person. And then there were eight special teams that were selected. So just by tradition in WRTC, the defending champion team is always invited back again. Uh, so that's RW1AC and RA1AIP. They have new calls now. Um, we also, as a um, organizing committee, decided that we wanted to dedicate one youth team. So we have one team that was the best qualifier in the world under age 25. Uh, then we selected two wildcard teams and these were purely there to pick teams that um, you know we felt just got squeezed out through the numbers game or something in their uh, region. Uh, and then there were four sponsored teams and this is something that WRTCs have done over the years to help fund the um, some of the expenses that, that that it takes to run, put on this event. So before we go on, let's ask one more uh, poll question. And that question is, what continent do you think the winning team will come from? So I put Africa and Oceania together only because the uh, poll feature in GoToMeeting only allows five answers. Right, and we do have some teams that come from more than one continent, so I'm thinking mostly we've been using the team leader as the um, indicator of where a team is, is from, even though they may have chosen somebody from a different continent. So, uh, okay, very good. Thanks, everyone. Let's close this one and share it. 
And what we see here is that 56% of the people think North America, a team from North America will win, 38% from Europe. Uh, so those are the overwhelming uh, majority. And um, it's too bad there's not a way to do an essay response here so we could find out why you were thinking that would be the way it is. So it, it's going to be interesting because um, there's a lot of quality across the board uh, from all continents. So I think everybody really has a chance here. Okay, so let's take a look at the teams. There are 32 teams coming from Europe, and I think what this tells us more than anything is just how much the center of gravity for contest activity has shifted to Europe. There is a lot of very active um, contesters there. We did divide Europe into six different regions. So EU1 tends to be south and west. Uh, EU2 tends to be south central. EU3 is more to the north. Um, EU4 is to the east, and uh, EU5 is southeast. EU6 is uh, Russia. And as you look through this list, um, we have a really pretty good mix of people, both people with single op experience and people from multi ops. Uh, we did have one recent uh, last-minute replacement, uh, YL2GQT in, uh, the, is now the teammate of YL1ZF, and that's strictly because YL3DW um, was having trouble uh, getting a visa in time, so uh, they made a change there. Feel bad for YL3DW, um, but Andy uh, will fill in very well for him. Uh, the team of um, 9A5K and 9A1TT, uh, 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 got some help getting in. Um, E77DX in uh, Bracco, Bracho, um, he qualified uh, to be a team leader and decided to join OE3DIA. So by becoming a teammate, that cleared up another team leader spot. And the way things work is when if somebody declined to come or was unable to come for whatever reason, um, the selection goes to the next uh, per, next qualifier, and then they have the option of what to do. Both of the wildcard teams for WRTC 2014 came from Europe. Um, although LZ4AX, Alex is a well-known operator of K3CR. It's been in the U.S. for uh, a number of years, so he really probably should count as, <laughs> as being from North America, but um, still uses his Bulgarian nationality. Uh, two Germans. And then um, our youth team is uh, IZ1LBG was the qualifier there. He did a fantastic um, qualifying score. And then uh, the first of the four sponsored teams is uh, uh, Radio Azores, and uh, that's OH2BH and OH2MM. So a lot of European teams. So just on the numbers, Europe has more than half of the teams. Now when we look at the Americas, North and South America together, uh, one of the criteria was that we wanted a team from every call area in the United States. So there are uh, 10 U.S. teams. Uh, W4 being geographically diverse uh, has two teams, an east and a west, and then uh, W6 has a north and a south uh, team. Uh, again, in NA4E we had a, um, a replacement. Unfortunately, KE3X uh, could not make it, and so N4YDU took over the team leader spot, and uh, Nate did a really great thing and kept um, the teammate that uh, KE3X had. So. Um, but I think they'll be a <laughs> they'll be a very strong team in their own right. Um, N5DX, uh, you may not be aware, he, he was qualified living in Arkansas, but just took an assignment for two years to live in the Cayman Islands. So um, he's coming back to uh, do the contest uh, from the states, uh, but he's living in ZF now. Uh, but really interesting mix in Canada. There was a, a West team and an East team. Uh, and the East team is VY2ZM, who chose his son to be his uh, partner um, or his teammate. Uh, and then uh, for Canada West, we have VE7CC and VE7SV, who have been partners together. I think this is their fourth or fifth WRTC, so very experienced hands uh, out there. Um, NA10, KU1CW is the representative there. He chose his, um, I think it's his cousin, EA5GTQ, so another uh, 
a team of relatives there. In South America, we have uh, just two teams um, from qualifying regions, regions in South America, uh, but they're really strong ones, so it should be interesting to see how they do. Uh, our other three sponsored teams all, can, all are representing the Americas, so we have W2SC and N2NL as a team. We have NR5M and W2GD representing another sponsored team, and then uh, um, PY5EG and K1LZ um, went together to sponsor the uh, Brazil-Bulgaria friendship team. So it's a very interesting mixing of PY1 and X uh, partnered with um, LZ3YY. Africa, Asia, and Oceania are not, there aren't a lot of teams, but this is mostly, uh, you know, when you think about it, the same as what we see uh, from uh, the contest results. <laughs> there are just not that many Africans or Oceania uh, entries. So our entry from Africa is Ash, uh, 3V stroke KF5EYY. Uh, you may all know him uh, under 3V8BB in the contests. Um, we have five teams from Asia, two from Asiatic Russia, one from Cyprus. The Cyprus team, this is their third, I think, WRTC together. A lot of experience there. Very happy to have a team from China. This will be the second time that China has uh, participated in WRTC. And then we have uh, the Japan team uh, led by JH5GHM. From Oceania, um, the way qualifying worked in Oceania is we divided it into two, kind of two sub-qualifying regions, a north and a south, and um, so that, uh, and then picked the, te the, the uh, team leader that had the highest uh, overall score, and that was KH6ND. He chose KH6SH as his partner. So the really cool thing about this is from our teams, we have 37 different countries uh, represented and uh, that will be marching in and we use the Olympic um, countries here so Virgin Islands is a uh, <laughs> you know we know it's part of America but um, the way the Olympics do it it's uh, considered a separate country so K9VV is lives there now and he's the Caribbean representative and so he'll be marching in under that banner Another tradition of WRTC is that each team has a referee. Uh, the referee's job is to make sure that the rules are followed and to answer any um, questions that may occur uh, on site. And uh, we put out the, once the team selections were made, we put out a call for anyone who wanted to become a referee. And we received twice as many applications as we had spaces for. So there were some difficult decisions made here. Uh, but we were looking for someone who could do both CW and SSB uh, because of the activity, there will be a lot of activity on CW. The, uh, the way the rules work this year is both teams will be able to, or both team members will be able to transmit at any time. So they're really going to be operating, a, uh, I don't want to call it a multi-two, but it will be two guys operating at the same time. So the referee um, will need to listen and monitor both of those at the same time. And... Uh, we needed proficiency in English and the ability to attend the event. And like I said, we had more applications than we could um, uh, take, so it worked out. That it was quite a uh, quite a selection process, and I think we got a really good group. We picked six in in the end. We picked sixty five referees. Uh, we wanted to have some extra ones um, in case somebody couldn't make it. We've already had a couple of people drop out. So uh, that so the good news is we have enough referees to cover all the teams. You can see the list here. Um, everyone here is a, an established, experienced, well-known contester. So uh, we're quite comfortable that we have uh, plenty of oversight for the for the teams. And I know in my WRTC experiences, it's, it's uh, you know it's difficult to be a referee because you just get to watch. But at the same time, if you get a good team, you really can have an exciting weekend of watching uh, two great operators, um, how they run people, how they pass 
multipliers between them, how they work together, how they make band change decisions, and so on. And so generally what you find coming out of this is that the, the teams and the referees will be uh, lifelong friends or at least uh, you know, always have an extra nice thing to say when they uh, work each other on the air in a future contest. Now the referees have the job of monitoring things on site and making sure the rules are followed. The judging committee are actually the ones who um, you know, authenticate the results and declare who the winner is. And uh, so our chief judge uh, this year, as, it, as, it, as he has done before, is K1ZZ, um, impeccable credentials. And uh, he has a great team uh, working with him, K1TO, N6AA, EY8MM, and G3XTT. All these guys are well known and uh, have been through this the WRTC judging experience before, uh, so I'm sure they will do a a great job. And for the most part, their job should be pretty easy, but uh, they occasionally get to uh, make difficult calls about what counts or what do we do if if something unusual happens. Uh, so let's hope their job is easy this time. Probably the most important thing and also the least talked about is the over 400 volunteers that are going to help put this event on. Think about it. We're going to build 65 stations. So the 59 for the teams plus some spares because we know there's going to be a problem somewhere. We just don't know which one. So we're building extra. So we're going to build 65 stations in less than 72 hours. So think about your normal field day group and how much trouble they have uh, you know, just building one or two stations, and then think we're going to build 65 stations on 65 different locations or sites. Uh, starting on uh, a few will start on Wednesday afternoon, but most of them will be done on Thursday. So really, uh, most of the work will actually happen in less than 24 hours. So these guys are going. It's an incredible job. Uh, you would be very impressed at the manuals and so on, and the organizational and logistic work that's gone in in the back of this, but um, we're really proud of the volunteers and that there are so many of them. We have uh, not only from New England, but also some people coming up from Florida and Tennessee and, and even as far away as California to, um, and, and even some from outside the U.S. that are coming to help set up things. And what you're looking at here on the pictures is from a training session that we did a few weeks ago. So for each station, we need to put up the antennas. The competitors are not allowed to touch the antennas. They're, no one is allowed to climb. So uh, the, the site teams will, or the beam teams will put up the antenna structures, and then the site team will provide the support. So food and water, make sure the generator is still running, provide site security, you know, answer questions from any visitors that happen to wander by. Their job is to make sure that the, everything runs smoothly so that the competitors can focus strictly on operating. Uh, it's a little difficult to see in this picture, but um, this is our planned operating sites. So we have um, locations from uh, down in the southern part of Massachusetts all the way up to, we have one station located just in southern New Hampshire. Uh, headquarters, you see where it says HQ, that is the headquarters hotel. So that's where the center of things will be, and when we turn people loose, they will go find their way to stations in the north or the south. Uh, the total spread here, it says 120 kilometers. It might be slightly more than that, but no one is more than one hour from the uh, headquarters uh, location to their station. And this doesn't, it, you, would, you would wonder why we had to do this, but in New England there's very few, uh, very little land that is, uh, that's, uh, you know, flat, and uh, not in a valley or, or on top of a hill or has, you know, a hotel built on it or an office building or houses or something. So we really had to look hard to find parkland that met the requirements that we wanted. And so you'll see there's really three main clusters. There's one to the very south here in Miles Standish State Forest. There's another one uh, very close to Boston uh, in Wampatuck State Park. And then another one up in the north e northeastern, I mean, northwestern corner which is Devons, which is a former military base that uh, is now available for public use. And so uh, uh, those, those are the big clumps of stations, and everything else is wherever we could get it. 
So we're not doing all this for the first time. In 2012, we set up 12 stations, and in 2013, we set up 25 stations. And those were really the practice runs for WRTC 2014. Uh, in the first test run, it was just, can we do it? Can, is, the, is our antenna raising scheme going to work? Uh, do, the, you know, do the sites match up with the um, uh, terrain analysis uh, software uh, predictions and so on? We did work with uh, the RBN network and some special um, skimmers that were located in different places to collect a lot of data about uh, signal levels and so on to confirm uh, how things work. Also, the station tests were very important ways to um, very important ways for us to train volunteers to start getting people used to the idea of what what work had to be um, what work had to be done uh, to build a station to monitor it and so on. And also, it was very important for the site owners to um, see us in see us in action. So as the, you know, the results of our testing was very encouraging to us. Uh, the sites that we had picked had no line noise problems. Of course, that could change in any moment. But we, the stations all seemed to be really quiet. They're all in very rural areas, so um, listening shouldn't be a problem. Uh, we were very impressed that a 40-foot high inverted V on 40 and 80 meters could work uh, Europeans on, on 80 and 40. Uh, and fairly easily, so we expect there will be some Europeans that will be able to work the teams on almost every band. Uh, so that was great news. Uh, the tri-banders, the TX38 tri-bander, has far more pattern than than uh, we had expected, so it turned out to be a great antenna. Uh, the RBN data matched up with what our computer models expected, so uh, we were happy with that. We now knew we could move forward, and that if a site modeled well, in terms of being equal northeast, south, west, and northwest, and then it was a good site. We also got a chance to validate our power detector technology and uh, our real-time online scoreboard. But more than anything, we learned a lot about how to um, do this. There were something like 500 or more suggestions after the 2012 station test of things that could be improved. There were much less than that the second time in 2013. So at this point, we feel really good that um, we have a system and documentation and everything. Uh, now the challenge is just executing it all 65 times. We did a training session uh, just a month ago for our and had more than 200 of our volunteers attend. Uh, this was our last chance to kind of get everybody together to help make sure that everybody's on the same page for uh, what their tasks were and how to do things. We went out into the field um, next to uh, the office here and set up two stations. Or, and so everyone got a chance to see it uh, and see, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's not difficult if you've seen it or done it before. And so by giving everyone a chance to see what they were getting into, that will really help us be much more efficient when we're on, in the field. It takes a lot of gear just to set up one station. So what you're seeing in this picture um, is our southern warehouse location. Uh, it's, it's in a company that's owned by K1 Lima Zulu. So Crossy's been very generous in giving us part of his warehouse, or part of his uh, manufacturing floor, so we could store all of this equipment. So on the left, you see the crew that's been uh, very responsible for getting the gear into the warehouse and checking it out and making sure that the tower sections will go together and that the top sections are already are set up with the rotators and the masts and so on. Again, anything we could do in advance to make it go faster when we get ready to set up. The two pictures you see on the right, for the training, we laid out all of the parts it takes to build one station on the driveway. And I'm sorry I didn't get one picture that shows everything, but uh, you can see it all here. So on the top picture, we have the tower section and so on. The bottom picture starts to show the, uh, you know, the generator, the 
the beam parts, the um, derrick mast and tilt bases and so on. Uh, it just takes a lot of gear to put one of these together. This is our other warehouse location in the north, not quite as nice as, as uh, K1LZ's place, but it's a storage warehouse. And uh, uh, what you see on the right there is one of the boxes that the uh, site team will have when they come on site. You know, when they come to pick everything up, they'll pick up all their gear, they'll have this box. It has all of the tools that they need, has the coaxes, the, the ropes for the guying. You see the yellow tape there. We have a policy that there will be yellow tape around the fall zone of the tower. And no one um, is allowed to go inside of that area uh, during the competition or during the setup. So uh, really everything we could think of is in that one box. And then on top of that, we have some uh, teams or some people that are set up as spares runners that have uh, boxes of extra things so that if somebody loses something or breaks apart or something like that, we'll be able to uh, get them replacement as quickly as possible. One of the, uh, I, don't wanna, I don't know if innovative is the right word here, but one of the key tools in our uh, ability to set up all these stations is this falling derrick method of raising the tower. So this tower is 40 feet of Rhone 25, and those of you who have worked with that tower before know that it is, it's fairly substantial, it's heavy. Uh, but the idea here is that you have a derrick pole and a tilt base, and uh, by rigging it up correctly, you can pull on the derrick uh, mast, and um, as the derrick mast goes down, it lifts the antenna up. The beauty of this is that we don't have any, no one has to climb the tower. That's, that's absolutely forbidden that anybody goes up the tower. So even if we get everything put up and then they run the SWR checks and they find a problem, it's not a difficult job to lower the thing back down, make the repairs, and then put it back up again. Um, our five-person beam team, so the beam team, uh, there are 16 of these beam teams. Each beam team has the responsibility to set up four sites. So they're going to be experts at showing up at a place, getting all the parts put together, getting everything laid out on the ground, running the rigging, pulling up the antenna, tying it off, and then they're off to the next one. And then the site team at the same time will be setting up the tent, the generator, tables, all the um, extra stuff that's needed. But uh, this is just very cool to watch how this goes up and how easily it goes up. But it's the result of some fantastic engineering and planning um, that went into the design and getting all the piece, custom parts made to be able to make this possible. Here's an example of a completed operating site. Uh, this was one of the station tests. I picked this one because it's on an athletic field next to a, a soccer or football uh, pitch and um, has, the best, has the best grass of any of the sites uh, uh, at all. It's, it's like uh, being on top of a putting green or something at a golf course. But uh, you see here there's a generator. Off to, uh, you know, away from the tent, we have the tent. All the tents look the same across all the stations, and then the, the tower with the beam and the uh, two inverted Vs. Just to kind of show you how it works out, we had someone fly around and take some pictures of the sites, and you'll notice that they all pretty much look the same. They all have the same tent. They all have the same antenna. Uh, the extra tents and cars and trucks and so on that you see are... Uh, from the site team because they need a place to hang out while the um, competition is going on. And then you may notice in the um, bottom two in the, in the upper right picture a little blue uh, square. That is the privacy shelter around the, uh, around the toilet. So uh, part of the, you know, when you're operating in the field, we had to supply uh, uh, everything that somebody may need. So someone just asked a question if there was any documentation available so they could duplicate the tower setup. Uh, there is um, quite detailed uh, information for doing some of the work. Um, and then there is a commercial manufacturer that's going to take over making some of the uh, components as well. Uh, so after the competition is over, we'll release um, some of that information. I'm not sure exactly 
uh, what or how much detail. Okay, so we've got our 65 sites set up. It's Friday morning at the um, hotel. We've already had our uh, referee and competitor meetings to go over the rules and answer any questions that may, people may have. So Friday morning, we'll have one more joint meeting just to answer any follow-up questions, and then we begin the station draw. And uh, to me, this is one of the most exciting parts of the thing, not because uh, of anything specific, particular, it's just this is when you find out where you're going. <laughs> so each team will draw an envelope. That envelope will tell us what station that they have. It will also uh, give us their referee. Uh, they'll also get their referee assignment at the same time. So now they know where they're going. They know who their referee is. A driver um, or transportation a person, a volunteer, will be there ready to take them. So they'll grab their gear and um, head out to their site. Uh, so probably somewhere around 1500 UTC we'll send, that's 11 or yeah, 11 in the morning uh, local time, we'll be sending people off to their site so we expect them to be on site by noon or a little bit after uh, to begin setting up their equipment. There's plenty of time. The contest does not begin until the next morning at 8 a.m. but um, you know, I'm sure there'll be a few surprises uh, for teams, uh, but hopefully they'll all set up very quickly. And then they'll have the option of, um, you know, sticking around to operate for a while, learn the bands, uh, make sure everything is working, or they can um, come back to the hotel. We do expect all of the teams to return to the headquarters hotel to spend the night. I don't think anybody will, will want to spend the night in the uh, tents on site. It's not going to be very comfortable. Uh, there's really no facilities for sleeping there, but um, the site teams, the reason that they're there is to provide security and watch over everything. So you can come back to the hotel, sleep, get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning, grab breakfast at the hotel. Uh, we'll have a bag ready to go, and, and the teams will be back at their sites. Our sunrise is about 5.30 in the morning here, so there's plenty of light in the morning. The really exciting moment is at 11.45 UTC, so 15 minutes before the uh, competition, the referee will open the envelope that has the call sign for the team. So they'll have 15 minutes to program their keyers and so on. They're not allowed to listen to the bands during that period. The radio receivers have to be off, but they'll get the computer software all set up to, uh, with their call. And um, at 12 Zulu, uh, the race begins. Now the teams are all going to be using one by one call signs. So uh, the list of calls that will that we're using is on the screen here. Um, there's a few letters that we're not using E H, um, just because they can be potentially confusing. Uh, J Q J and Q were left out because they're too long. Uh, there was just a feeling that they were they were longer than the other calls, and and uh, some people think that makes a big difference. And then the letter X, it turns out, is not permitted uh, in, by the FCC regulations for the one-by-one -one call. So that, that wasn't a choice. But uh, plenty, of, plenty of call signs here, all being one-by-ones. They'll be very distinctive. You'll have no trouble finding them on the bands and recognizing that they're a WRTC station because if it's a one-by-one a -one call with a one in it, it, uh, it, it's one of the WRTC teams. And uh, we do have a checklist available on the website if you want to uh, print it out and uh, use that to keep track of the teams as you work them. Okay, for scoring, just let's just talk about this quickly so you can kind of understand the um, motivation of the teams. Um, it's five bands. 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters, CW and single sideband. You can work stations once per band and mode. So uh, if you, to work all the teams, uh, 59 teams on 10 band modes, that's 590 QSOs. Uh, the QSO points for the team, if they work ITU zone 8, that's the zone that um, WRTC is in, it's worth two points. If they work in North America, but outside Zone 8, it's three points. And if they work outside of North America, it's five. 
And when they work the headquarters stations, uh, those are two points as well. So the scoring is different than the AIRU, but this scoring is only used by the WRTC stations uh, at competitors, so it's, it's, it's fine for them. But you can see here there's an emphasis on working DX uh, outside North America and also trying to work outside of Zone 8, outside of the East Coast of the U.S. So uh, the teams will definitely be focusing on that to improve the QSO points. And then the multipliers is the DXCC countries plus the, the headquarters society stations on each band. Not by mode, but by band. So um, this is, again, different than the IARU scoring. We're not using zones for anything. We're just using DXCC countries and, and IARU uh, headquarter uh, stations on each band. So um, what we saw in the station tests in 2013 was that multipliers are very important. Uh, I don't think you can win the contest just by having the biggest QSO total. The teams are going to have to make some strategic decisions about uh, where to go and, and, and win. One of the things that we're doing uh, this time, and, and KM3T and WA1Z have put a lot of work into the concept of a real-time scoreboard. Uh, we're going to have two operators, and both operators will be using a computer, and the computers will be networked together so that they can keep up with what their score is for themselves. Uh, Dave and Bob took a Raspberry Pi computer, put it in the middle of that network connection so it can sniff the traffic going back and forth, regardless of which logging software that they're using, grab the score and the band breakdown information, and transmit that every five minutes through, with, through the cellular network. And Dave, in particular, has driven to every WRTC site twice and checked out the, um, the wireless cellular connectivity and signal strength and so on. So we're very optimistic that, that we're going to have a connection at every place. Um, if for some reason the connection fails, the referee will get an SMS text message asking them to start SMS texting the scores in uh, while we uh, try to resolve what the problem might be. So... Uh, it's going to be really exciting because you're going to be able to go to the scoreboard and in the past WRTCs you would go to the scoreboard every hour to, when you saw a change. Everybody in the bar would go over it at the end of the hour to see what the next update was going to be. We're going to now be in a mode where the scores will all be updating all the time. So every team will be sending every five minutes but it may not all be on the same cycle. So it should be a, a lot of fun to watch the scores as they bubble up and down uh, as the teams catch an opening or get a big run or some extra multipliers, that kind of thing. You'll notice that on the live scoreboard, uh, the teams are listed by their actual calls because we want the spectators to know who the teams are. But what we're not doing is telling you which team is under which one-by-one -one call. Uh, so uh, the you know, you just have to get on the air and work all the one-by-one -one calls that you can find, um, but you'll be able to look on the scoreboard and see how your friends are doing or how your countrymen are doing. Uh, in addition to kind of the overall leader uh, scoreboard, there's also a leaderboard to say who's winning for CW and sideband QSOs and multipliers and so on. And then one of the features that I find particularly interesting is you'll be able to select any two or three or four or five different competitors and put them and compare them so you can see how their scores are changing over time. Uh, so in the test simulation here, the scores climb pretty much at the same, but it'll be very interesting to see uh, how much things change uh, over time. So a little bit like you see in Formula One or um, in Le Mans, where uh, you, know, you can't always see all the cars circulating all the time, but you can come to the scoreboard and see uh, uh, who's in the lead and how they're doing. So this will be really exciting. We're, we're really excited about having this, this level of automation to make uh, score updates continuous. Another feature that's very important is that we make sure, um, uh, if we make sure that uh, you know, the teams stay under 100 watts, so there's a power monitor uh, that was built, very clever design, doesn't require any extra power or, or external power. It gets its power from the coax but it will show a green LED if the power is less than 100 watts, yellow if it's a little more, and red if it's too high. Your referee, who will be sitting behind you or next to you, will be watching that, and if he sees the red light go on, he'll tap you on the shoulder and, uh, and remind you to turn the power down. Um, 
if you continue to do it or if you ignore him, then you run the risk of the judging committee getting to make a decision. So uh, anyway, it's a very simple scheme. We don't have to worry about bouncing watt meters or you know any of that kind of stuff or relying on the radios. We can see very graphically green, yellow, red, whether people are, um, have the right power level. Now, let's talk about the, for those of you who are not going to be one of the WRTC competitors, how do you have fun with this whole thing? Well, there's two levels of awards. Um, we want everybody to get on and work the WRTC teams on as many band modes as possible. Uh, you could have a great weekend just chasing these guys up and down the bands. We are going to 100% QSL every contact that the WRC teams make. Uh, so if you work us anywhere, you're going to get a QSL card. The ARRL very, uh, has been a tremendous help to us in this whole competition, and one of the things they've done is declared that the WRTC test stations will count five points in the ARRL Centennial QSO party. So there are quite a spirited competition going on of people trying to collect Centennial points. Here's a, here's a chance to have really thousands of points on offer in, in one weekend just by chasing all the teams on, on different bands. And then we're going to, once we've collected all the logs and processed them, we'll have a list of all the call signs that have worked all of the state, all 59 teams, and we'll put an online certificate um, up on the website so people can come print something out. But what we really want is for all of you to help by being assistant judges. So if you work the contest, if you work one or many or just don't work, you know, anything you do in the IARU contest, if you could send your log in before 1800 UTC on Sunday, so within six hours of the end of the contest, that will help us with the log checking. So we're, gonna, we're going to get access to all the logs that come into the, to the contest, and um, we're going to use those for the cross-checking. So everybody who submits a log by 1800 UTC, whether you worked any stations or not, but everybody who submits a log, will go into a drawing for uh, one of 25 assistant judge hats. So everybody who submits a log is effectively assistant judge, an, an assistant judge. The bronze award, the bronze medal, would go to anyone with contacts on more than 30 band modes. So if you manage to work um, 20 teams on uh, two different bands, uh, in, in, all on CW, you would have 40 band modes. So it's pretty simple. Uh, it's not a very high bar to get over, but if you do that, we're going to have a random drawing for 10 WRTC bronze medals or 50 mouse pads. What you really want to do, though, is, is, is go to a little bit higher standard. Work all 59 teams. We are going to give a silver medal to the first five stations from each continent that are able to work all 59 teams, period. So go, you, know, you want to work the teams as fast as you can. We're doing it by continent, so even if you're far away, you still have a chance. And uh, then everybody else, other than if you're not in the first five, that's okay. You still have a, a chance to, to win a WRTC hat. And then the gold award, this is the highest level of achievement. This is really about working the most band modes. So again, by continent, and W1 is a separate case because it will all be ground wave, um, the top five band mode leaders in each continent in W1 will get a gold medal uh, for their achievement. So even from you know far away in Oceania or something, you still have the chance to be one of the top five band mode leaders by, by uh, really working hard and, and getting through to the teams. And that will help the teams too because they need the activity for the QSO points and also uh, the multipliers. So the WRTC 2014 chase, this is your chance to uh, get in the game. After the contest, that, so the contest is 24 hours at 12 Zulu. The teams have 30 minutes to submit their log. And, and by the way, all the teams are recording the contest, so they have to record and, and submit that recording to the referee. Uh, and then at 1800, we have the deadline for the logs. I've just talked about that. Now, while everybody is sleeping and watching the World Cup on Sunday afternoon, the judging committee will be processing the logs and everything. And... Uh, and then on Monday, all of us will go on, you know, all the competitors and volunteers and so on, everyone who signed up uh, will go on these tours. We have a tour to the Marconi um, transmitting site in Cape Cod, and we also 
have a tour to the Groton Sub Museum. Uh, those are the two biggest ones. There's some other ones, uh, but we'll, it'll give all the teams a chance to get together and do something fun, talk about the contest, and then uh, Monday evening at the closing ceremony, we will announce the winners. So we've talked about how you can participate by working the teams on the air. Uh, if you want to learn more about the teams, more detail about them, uh, the NCJ this month has uh, profiles of all the competitors and referees, but the WRTC website also has um, the profiles of all the teams. So uh, spend a few minutes and, and read something about these guys. I found it fascinating to learn about the people that are behind these call signs that we that we work all the time. We are going to do some live video streaming from the hotel, from the headquarters hotel. Uh, right now, the times that we've picked out are mostly in the evening, um, but we're we may try to do some morning ones to to make it a little bit easier for people in Europe to to see. So keep checking back to this to the uh, uh, video streaming uh, page on the on the website at. We should know by uh, uh, Tuesday whether we'll be able to do some morning sessions uh, as well. But we'd like to give people who are not able to attend as much chance as possible to to see what's going on. We'll try. We'll bring over some of the competitors to and referees to to interview them, talk about what they're um, thinking and experiencing. Uh, so um, the live video uh, should be a lot of fun. Now. This is a competition. It's pretty serious business for the guys that are coming. Uh, we want to keep the game as fair as possible. So when you work, if you're going to chase the teams, please work all of them. Don't just work your friends. Uh, when we say no cheerleading, we mean, uh, you know, if you spot a team, that's great, but don't say what who they are. So it's okay to spot W1A. It's not okay to spot W1A, this is the German team, or this is the Russian team, or whatever. Um, or sounds like, you know, my, fr my friend. Uh, just don't. I mean, we can't, uh, it's, it, let's keep it fair. Let's make everybody, um, you know, one of the reasons we give everybody a different call sign is to, so that, uh, to try to eliminate some of this uh, cheerleading or biasing. No club roster QSO, so don't sit there and work a team with uh, your call and your friend's call and your sister's call and your cl you know club call and so on. Um, just work them once with the call, with the call sign that, that you have. Um, again, uh, keep it fair. Uh, we are going to remove all unique QSOs, so there's actually no advantage to giving a team uh, uh, only one only one QSO uh, and not working anybody else. So if you get on the air, work as many teams as you can. And uh, somebody asked the question, that due to the live scoreboard, will we know who's going to win? We'll have a pr we should have a pretty good idea, but as we've seen in previous WRTCs, the scores will be so close there's a very good chance that there could be some shuffling at the top uh, as we start doing the cross-checking. So, um, you know, it's like any other contest. You'll know the uh, you'll know who the guys at the top are, but you may not know who the winner is. By the way, this is the 100th anniversary of ARL, and uh, it's it was one of the reasons that we wanted to do WRTC in this same year to kind of put these two things together. And the ARL is only 90 miles down the road from uh, where WRTC will be happening. They're having their national convention one week later. Um, I also, again, wanted to repeat, the ARL has been fantastic in helping us uh, with this event. Uh, the ARL Foundation uh, provided some funding to help us with uh, doing media relations and so on. So uh, it's, it, it's, it's really been great. And you've seen a lot of information in the, in the WRTC, I mean, in the ARL contest newsletter, and you saw it in Dave Sumner's um, editorial in July QST and so on. So really great thing. Another group that we have to thank, because this probably couldn't happen without help from these companies, and that is the sponsors that have donated either money or materials uh, to help us in the, you know, put this all together. So uh, give you an example, Times Microwave Systems has given us more than six miles of coax to make this possible. Think about that for a minute. Six miles of coax. That's what it takes to put 65 stations together with three coaxes at 100 and 
uh, or at about 40 meters a piece. Um, you know, Mastrant provided all of the uh, guying ropes and so on. That was a really big deal. Uh, Honda helped us with the generators. Uh, some of these companies have provided materials. Some of them provided money. But um, these guys really have helped us make this all possible. Another important group for us are all the people who helped with tent sponsorships. And I've just listed the clubs here. Um, but we had a thing where clubs could, for $1,000 could do a tent sponsorship. And this was a way of helping to fund all those 65 sites that we have to set up. And it's really been fantastic the way various clubs have stepped forward, especially the Florida Contest Group, Frankfurt Radio Club, Potomac Valley Radio Club, Yankee Clipper, Northern Cal, all the big clubs. They would send us one tent sponsorship, and then a little while later they would have another meeting, and they would send us another one. Um, but really all of these um, clubs have been fantastic, and we really appreciate their help. When we sold all the tent sponsorships, we looked into team village sponsorships. This is the same thing, except now we're talking about the hospitality portions of the event or just the housing of all these um, competitors and referees. And again, fantastic response from FRC, the Bavarian Contest Club, Yankee Clipper again. Um, we had a, a thing at Dayton uh, at the contest dinner. Three of the team village sponsorships were put together by different tables at the contest dinner and so on. Uh, I think there was even a um, uh, the Dayton Riddy contest dinner. Uh, you know, Riddy guys, what do they have to do with CW and SSB contesting? But they uh, stepped forward uh, with money for a team village sponsorship. So, again, just these are all people who help make make this thing possible. There was a huge list of uh, individuals, and I couldn't fit them all on one slide. But in the end, who will win it? Who's going to take home the gold medal? from WRTC 2014. That's, that's what we're going to know by, uh, you know, um, a week and a day from now. And I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing the decisions that teams make and how, how the conditions play out, how the activity is on the band. I think it's just going to be, um, uh, you know, there's speculation that we may have a team make 5,000 QSOs in 24 hours to win. So that's the, that's the mark that some of these guys are talking about. So with that, I realize I've run a little bit o over time, but um, if we have any uh, questions, um, you can type them into to the box. But otherwise, we will look for everyone to uh, to get on the air and uh, work the teams this weekend. Uh, I think that there's probably nothing better that you can do to make it more fun for everybody and the awards and so on that we're giving out are uh, uh, really just a way to, to say thank you for helping out in this in this whole event. So with that I don't see any new questions. Thank you all very much for uh, for joining and we'll see you on the radio.